Good, every, good morning, everyone. Um, I am setting this up, so just give me a second, um, and then we'll start our service. Um, I want to talk today about the the message of the, Adv the Adventist message that inspired me the most. But before we start, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, well, normally, we would uh, be in church today, but as I look out my window, I see nothing but snow and ice, and uh, I think it's about nine degrees. So uh, we're going to stay home where it's nice and warm, and uh, we have our um, uh, our food, our water, all those things that make us happy. So welcome to you and to those who are maybe not members of our church. We have a large uh, group of people that are starting to like our page. We had almost 500 uh, last month, and I think we're up to about 1,600 people that like this page. So we're, we're, we welcome you as well. I want to make a few announcements. Um, the Georgia Cumberland Conference, the prayer conference, is set for February 2nd and through the 4th. Now, I will tell you that registration deadline is passed. That was actually January 17th. But I'm sure if you contact them, uh, you would be able to attend it. We were supposed to have a religious liberty offering today, um, uh, on January 20th, but hopefully we'll do that next week. Also a reminder that Pastor Daniel's leading a youth meeting on the first three Fridays of the month at 6 p.m. That will be probably the next one will be the first Friday in February. Also mark your calendars for February 17th. Noah Banks is going to be returning to our church to train us on door-to-door -door, um, witnessing and door-to-door -door, uh, Bible studies. Also, I want to give a shout out to John and Jennifer Philpot. Uh, they just celebrated their anniversary on the 18th. So, with that said, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get right into the message for today. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with seeking a blessing on this cold winter morning. Lord, we ask that your presence would be with us in spirit and in truth as we look at your word. Uh, Father, bless those in our church that may be ailing or hurting in some way. We pray that you would attend to their every needs. I pray, Father, for all those that are, uh, that are not members of our church that are listening in. Whatever it is in their life, Father, may they find it today as we study this most important message. We will give you all the glory and all the honor for this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the message that inspired me the most, um, I often tell people in the Adventist church that I'm the Gentile of the Adventist. And what I mean by that, I wasn't raised SDA. In fact, I Hadn't even heard about Seventh-day Adventists till I was about 24 or 25 years old. I was down on the campus, Southern, uh, Southern College campus, for a bike race. And I asked somebody, uh, what kind of school is this? And somebody whispered, it's a Seventh-day Adventist. And I thought, why are we whispering? <laughs> they seem to kind of hold that place in some kind of uh, holy... Um, holy way. Um, but anyway, that's kind of my first contact. I I've, I've thought to myself, what is a Seventh-day Adventist? Little did I know that I would be go from uh, an unbeliever, which I was at that time. I was actually an atheist when I was down there on that campus. Little did I know what plan God had for me. So I started to, actually what happened not too long after that, my uh, wife who was a Christian at the time, got tired of hearing me complain about her faith and finally challenged me to study the material that she was studying and to prove her wrong. So I had the wrong motive, but I started studying the Bible to prove her wrong. But <laughs> suffice it to say, 
within uh, a matter of a few weeks, a few months, I started coming across things in the Bible that excited me. It actually inspired me because it answered things that I had thought about as an unbeliever and uh, things all through my life. Like what happens to a person when they die, the state of the dead, the return of Christ. I'd never seen a more clear picture of the return of Christ than in these studies. The prophecies, uh, particularly Daniel 2, that one just uh, amazed me because I had studied those four great monarchs in college. Hell, I could not understand how a God of love would torture somebody throughout eternity because they didn't accept uh, Jesus. Um, and I found out the truth about hell. Yeah, there's a hell, but it's hotter than people even imagine because it burns the people up. It's, it's an end. It's the wages of sin, which is the eternal death. So I love that God loves people. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I also learned about the inspiration of the Bible and health, etc. But what excited me the most <clears throat> was the ease of being saved through Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's right. That's what I said. The ease of being saved through Jesus Christ. Not only from the penalty of sin, but the power of sin. And one day, he will save us from the presence of sin. That's what I call the three P's of salvation. Salvation to the uttermost. He saves me from the penalty of sin when I receive him. If there is sin in my life, uh, I'm drinking, I'm smoking, I'm, I'm a hater, whatever it is, God will save me from that power. And then one day he'll take us to where he is now and save us from the presence of the sin. So you, my Seventh-day Adventist friends, told, told me that what I needed to do, uh, knowing all this, was to repent, to receive Jesus, and be baptized. And I would come up out of those waters a new creature. And this I did. In a pew back in Nashville in August of 1975, I asked Jesus into my life. It was the greatest decision I ever made uh, in my entire life because I now have eternal life through Christ. But I wanted to know how should I live going forward? I had a desire to honor God through my life, but also had a, a, a desire to share what I knew with other people. And you told me how. How should I live my life? You told me I was to live a life by faith not by works. And we're going to talk about that a little bit here. Don't get me wrong. I discovered the relationship between the two of faith and works. And I began to share my experience with others, exploring how they related to each other. I want to start off with this quote by D.L. Moody. I've never met a man who's given me as much trouble as myself. That certainly applied to me. Everything bad that, that had happened in my life that was in my control, I had uh, brought it on myself. Now, I know sometimes trouble comes looking for you. But if you think about it, a lot of times, we are sometimes our own worst enemy. Sometimes a church can be that too. It can be its own worst enemy simply because we're not reflecting the love of Christ. I want to also start with this would be our scripture for the day. I'll just read this and I'll come back to it later as we move through our time together. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling. Now, worthy of his calling. Each person wants to feel worthy. Uh, and how do we go about that? How do we live the life of feeling worthy? Well, Paul answers. It says, and that by his power. Now, notice what he, he does through his power. He may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness. Now, it's funny. Once you are a Christian, you want to bring forth fruit. You desire to be good. And that's what I want it to be. And your every deed, that's works, every work that you do is prompted by faith. So we see something right off the bat here is very 
important, and this will be our theme through here. It is by his power, prompted by faith, that we will have fruit and will be good and our deeds will follow. Now, I like to use uh, this illustration here, and it's simply a statement that says, Jesus is the root and the works are the fruit. You cannot have the fruit if you don't have the root. Um, to me, this makes um, perfect sense to me. Uh, early in my journey with you, my Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters, I had to figure out how to live my life in Christ. Was I only conditionally saved? Did I need to do a life of do this, don't do that, so I could reach perfection before I died or Jesus came? But you taught me that works rightly understood takes the pressure off of us to work to be worthy for salvation. I wanted to grow in Christ, but how? Here's where you taught me goodness and good works are the fruit. Faith in his power is the root. Without him, we can do nothing, including goodness, faith, and works. We know that famous passage from Jesus where he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You also introduced me to uh, Ellen White's writings, one of the uh, ancestors of our faith, I guess you could say, one of the founders of our faith. She had wonderful insight about what I needed to know about the growth in Christ. And I think this is very biblical as well. Um, I want to read this to you. It says, Our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness, all depend upon our union with Christ. Well, there it is. Union with Christ, so important. It is by communication with him daily, hourly, by abiding in him that we are to grow in grace. So this is a, a, a moment by moment experience. He is not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. It is Christ first and last and always. He is to be with us, not only at the beginning and the end of our course, but at every step of the way. David says in Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Wow, that made sense to me. Um, and I immediately started morning time with Christ, reading, praying, seeking a closer walk with him. That's my daily routine. I start every day with Christ. Sometimes it'll be 30 minutes, sometimes an hour, sometimes two or three hours. But I want to know my Lord more and more every day. And I started that back years ago, and I continue it to, to this day. Not because I have to. It's not something that's required. It's because I want to. God has changed my life. Now, it's interesting to note that I was, was not the only one who has this struggle between faith and works. I like this quote from Martin Luther King. Uh, let's read this. Um, I'm sorry, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther. Uh, two different people. Uh, in the monastery, Luther was driven to find acceptance with God through works. He wrote, now listen to what, what Martin Luther was doing. He says, I tortured myself with prayer. You know, how can prayer be torture? But he says, I tortured myself with prayer, with fasting, with vigils and freezing. The frost alone might have killed me. What else did I seek by doing this but God? who was supposed to take note of my strict observance of the monastic order in my austere life. So we see this struggle with Martin Luther. He went on to say, 
I constantly walked in a dream and lived in real idolatry for I did not believe in Christ. Now, isn't that interesting? He was religious, but he didn't believe in Christ. I regarded him only as a severe and terrible judge portrayed as seated on a rainbow. You know, sometimes I had this same experience of looking at God as some terrible judge who was waiting for me to make a, a mistake so he could knock me out of heaven. As we study here, we'll find out that's just not true. Elsewhere, he, he recalled, when I was a monk, I wearied myself greatly for almost 15 years with the daily sacrifice, tortured myself with fasting, vigil, prayers, and other very rigorous works. I earnestly thought to acquire righteousness by, by my works. So I wasn't the only one that was trying, was struggling about how do I live my life in Christ? You know, what freedom and peace in knowing we are not required to appease God to win his acceptance. We begin with his favor. I think this quote was from Ty Gibson. Um, I can't exactly remember it. I pulled it up from memory. But it is a very peaceful thing to know that the God we serve doesn't require sacrifices and doing this and don't doing that. That we, win it, that, that we began with his favor. He loves us. He has mercy, he has forgiveness. He's, and we're going to trip along the way, folks. I don't know that of anyone that is going to reach perfection like Jesus before he comes. Um, what is most important is that God is working in our lives and he loves us. Another passage from Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now this is important. This is how God shows his own love for us. He didn't wait for us to get our act together. He said that while we were still sinners, when we were kind of dead in sins, Christ died for us. That is a demonstration of his love for us, the cross. And as I mentioned, he did not wait for us to get to a certain point. And we must always keep that in mind. Uh, Jeremiah 18, 1 to 6, I won't read it, but I, here's the illustration. And that is that um, God is the potter, he's the molder, and we are the clay. So the clay does not mold itself. That was important for me to understand. I could not mold myself. God had to mold me. It's impossible for me to um, mold myself. Now I want to shift gears here a bit uh, because sometimes people misunderstand what I'm saying. A life of faith does not, and I'll, I'll add grace in here, a life of faith under grace does not diminish the law of God. Now I know it's a popular teaching out there that we are under grace and no under no longer under the law, and that is a true statement. But it doesn't mean that the law has been diminished. The law is still there, not as a method of salvation. It's never been a method of salvation, but as a result of salvation. It is God's will. So I want to talk about this a little bit with my SDA friends and those who are listening in. Paul said it so clear, clearly in Romans 3.31. He says, and I'm using a, the New Life Translation because I think this makes it even more clear. Well then, and I think King James starts off with, what shall we say then? But well then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. Wow. Man, what an eye-opener that was to me. That fulfilling the law meant that I had to have the faith first. Fulfilling the law didn't give me the faith. Faith gave me the power, as it was, to fulfill the law. 
In another place, in Romans 6, 1 to 2, uh, Paul said this about grace. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So even though we're under grace and we live a life by faith, it does not throw out the law. The law tells us what sin is. There's another passage that, said, that tells us what sin is, and it has to do with faith. Anyone not of faith is sin. So if we don't demonstrate faith, if we don't use faith, as it were, we're actually sinning. We don't have to, you know, kill somebody or, or lie to them or have other gods. I mean, those are definitely sins. Sin is a transgression of the law. But if to not have faith, to trust God, um, it is sin. But grace does not and faith does not diminish the law. Now, going back to our opening passage by Paul, I want to review this one more time. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you. Now, Paul is praying for this church in Thessalonica, and here's his prayer, that our God may, be, may make you worthy of his calling. He wants them to be worthy of God's calling. And that, that worthiness is by his power, he may bring that he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. So it's the key words here is his power and prompted by faith. Again, um, Jesus is the root and the works are the fruit. The fruit can't produce itself. It must have the root it must abide in the branch now I put this little illustration here you've often heard people say don't get the cart before the horse sometimes as Christians we'll do that too because we don't understand we think that works and obedience comes first and faith in Jesus is kind of you know it's back there but it is faith in Jesus if we as we just saw that's the power this horse needs to move up to the front of the carriage to make this journey work. <laughs> if we try to focus on works and obedience without faith, without Jesus, we don't have the power. Now, going back to Steps to Christ, a book that um, my Seventh-day Adventist friends and brothers and sisters introduced me to, it says many have an idea that we must do some part of the work alone. They have trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sins, right? When we ask for forgiveness, we're trusting God for that. But now they seek by their own efforts to live aright. Now that was my experience. How do I live aright after having my sins forgiven and trusted in that? Now if we try to do that, uh, this uh, Ellen White says, but every such effort must fail and then she reminds us of what jesus said we read earlier without me you can do nothing so if we try to by our own efforts to live a right it will fail if we don't have trust in christ jesus said this in john 15 3 to 4 he says you're already clean because of the word <laughs> I have spoken to you. Then he tells us something that's very important here. Remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Do you want the fruit of God's righteousness to come out in you? then you must remain in Christ. Now, I, part of my story um, was that I, one day I did not remain in Christ. It wasn't one day. I went almost 10 years never praying, never uh, having my morning devotions. I had disconnected myself 
from the from the vine. Now the great news is that God can graft us back in, which He did for me. But the point here is, we can't do anything without Christ, and that includes good works, obedience, anything you can name. In the Christian experience, must proceed from Christ, the power. And by the way, if you want to test to see if you're plugged in, if you're grafted into the vine, look at Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit. Now here's the fruit. And by the way, it doesn't say obedience here. It, it refers to these things that are the, the mark of someone who's been born again and connected in Christ. The, if you're, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Do you have love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Against such things there is no law. I particularly like this last part. There, there's no law that says thou shalt not love. <laughs> there's no law that says you shall not have joy and peace and kindness, etc. These are all fruit that that comes from the Spirit of God uh, through Jesus. So do your beliefs give you love, joy, and peace? Are you free in Christ? Or are you constantly looking for ways to please God through your good deeds? We're all, God already loves us. And what we do, if we do it, because we're abiding in Christ, we don't have to be overly concerned about being really religious and living a life of do this and don't do that. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, I know there's things we should do and shouldn't do, but anything that's outside that we do that's not connected with Christ is fake fruit. <laughs> I love this passage, and we'll end with, uh, with these <clears throat> these next few slides. I, I really love this, my SDA friends, when you talked about this when I was considering Christ. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. Did you get that? I've called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father I've made known to you. It's a wonderful thing to know that Jesus is a friend. That uh, I really love that idea that I could talk to God as, as if I'm talking to a friend. And I love Proverbs 18, 24. There's a friend, and we know who that friend is, who sticks closer than a brother. Jesus is closer uh I feel closer to Jesus than I do my own brother, my own relatives. Um, Ephesians 3, 18 to 19, Paul said this, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you will be able to understand. Now he is praying for the Ephesians that they would understand how wide, <clears throat> how long, and how high and deep his love is. He's actually praying for them. I pray that you will know the love of Christ. His love goes beyond anything we can understand. I pray that you'll be filled with God himself. This was his prayer and it's something we can experience. I've heard several times in my Christian experience people say, well, you know, I know pretty much everything there is to know about scripture. I do real good at Bible trivia. I know the Bible frontwards and backwards. You know, you can know doctrine and all those things, but how well have you experienced the rebirth experience, the love experience that God gives us, the forbearance, all those things that he wants us to know about? The love of Christ is a topic that will be there throughout eternity. All the topics that we worry about today, when Jesus comes, we'll no longer worry about them. We won't worry about the state of the dead. We won't learn, worry about hell. We won't 
worry about the health message, all those things. But the one thing that we will think about and study will be the cross, the plan of salvation, the love of Christ. So let us remember to focus on that as much as we possibly can so that we'll be filled with God himself. Paul goes on to say, God is able to do much more than we ask or think through his power working in us. Wow, what a powerful passage that is. We can do more through his power. You know, we there, the door is just wide open for a deeper experience in Christ through his power. May we see his shining greatness in the church. Amen. A great prayer for our churches. May all people in all time honor Jesus Christ. Let it be so. You can feel the pathos, as it were, in Paul's voice here. I want to end with uh, this uh, final word. By the way, I love this picture. It shows Christ pursuing us while we're dirty, while we're still sinners. I just love this, this picture. But it's all true, my friends. While we were still sinners, he pursued us. Then he died the death we rightly deserved, eternal death. It's all true. One day everyone will know for sure that he is the only Savior. He doesn't want anybody to perish, but that to all to repent and come to him. Then he will give you peace and joy like you've never known. Religion and theological debates can never give this to you. Only Jesus can. It's all true, my friends. Even if you claim to be an SDA Christian, a Baptist Christian, a, a Catholic Christian, whatever, but your life lacks love, joy, and peace. Would you turn to him today? He loves and he cares for you. Let us pray. Father, as we consider the great love of Christ, let us receive that power that is available to us through you. Lord, let us never become so legalistic and so closed-minded that we only follow a do this, don't do that life. Lord, we know from what we've studied that we will not do this or do that uh, when Christ is the root of our life. You will produce the fruit. But Father, that experience will be more about loving other people, forgiving other people, bringing other people to Christ. It will no longer be a religion about ourselves, but about you and other people. Thank you, Lord, for the great height and depth and width that you give us through your word. Bless us the rest of this day, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Goodbye, my friends, and have a great day in Christ.